All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuan. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Open Govern Products. Um, maybe you guys have heard of us. We work on the sixth floor. Um, hello, yeah. We work on the sixth floor of this building. Um, and can I, you guys have a quick show of hands? Like, how many people here have used or heard of Form SG before? Oh, Form SG, yeah. So, Form SG is um, our department's product that uh, really allows you to uh, transact with the Singapore government. So, uh, I work for the Singapore government as a software engineer. And recently, we've been building a really cool feature that's like practically hidden from like thing most users, um, but it's basically a zero knowledge system. So we want to translate uh, Form SG, which is basically Google Form for government, into a zero knowledge system because we want to make sure that when citizens interact with the government, that all their data will be encrypted, um, including on the cloud. The only people that are allowed to see the data are the, uh, is a form creator, which is a public officer, a civil servant, and people like yourself, right? So this is kind of what the product looks like. Um, it's mobile responsive. Um, and basically, the key question, I suppose, is what does zero knowledge mean, right? So basically, what happens is when the public officer creates a form, it receives a private key that's never seen by our servers, it is generated in the browser of a public officer. So, so the public officer safeguards this, right? And but the public key, right? The public key um, is provided with the form. So, um, when the submission comes in, right, you're able to take that public key, um, and this is invisible to the form filler, like uh, the citizen, right? But it will be used to encrypt the data before sending it to the cloud. And the cloud has your knowledge of the data that's storing. So it doesn't matter if NSA has a backdoor. Like, I mean, no, it actually does that. Uh, yeah, we try and minimize uh, the information uh, over the network. So we make sure that only the browsers can decrypt the data. So you might be submitting something really sensitive, like your NRC, um, some, or maybe this is like a form about, like, um, maybe AIDS sufferers uh, would be filling in, right? So it's really important that the data that you transfer to government is encrypted, right? And what happens uh, when the public officer wants to retrieve the data is that they have to provide this private key to decrypt the responses. Right. So what does a UI kind of look like? So this is like what happens when you create a new form. You type in a form name. Um, you have to download the private key. Um, you build and submit a form as usual as a public officer. right? And then you decrypt the responses by supplying the private key, which you can upload. Right. So all this sounds really cool. like. And encrypting and decrypting is, um, I think, familiar to many of you here. Um, but one feature that we really um, struggled with for a while is the so-called export CSV feature. Because um, as a public officer, when I want to download a large volume of responses, right, um, I need to be able to collate all the data that I have in the system. Right? And this button in the top right here is deceptively simple looking. Um, however, it's actually really tricky to implement because it requires a lot of heavy CPU cycles to decrypt every submission, and it actually pushes the bounds of the browser performance, like memory in terms of memory, CPU. In fact, when you try and do it on mobile, um, the device actually heats up, right? And we really don't want this. Um, it also pushes the bound of UX because um, there's a long waiting time if you have very large volume of submissions, you can have out of memory crashes and battery life drain. So. The talk will mainly focus on how we optimize this uh, using some of the technologies that um, the previous talk was actually sharing. But that's really interesting. Um, so what happens under the hood? Um, when we first built this feature, um, we went with the standard solution, RSA with AES, right? So this is a similar, this is the flow that I was talking about. You have a public and private key pair, um, and the public key goes to the server. Um, the user or the citizen accesses the form, and the public key is used to encrypt. And when you have to get the data, you supply the private key. Now, the problem is um, when we tried to launch it last year for the National Day ticket applications, we realized that uh, 100,000 form submissions took two hours and 40 minutes to decrypt. So that's made, made the solution completely unusable. Like in theory, it works fine. In practice, it was not usable, right? So, what do we do? So we did some research and we realized that actually RSA was like the 70s, right? Um, there's a new class of algorithms called analytic curve cryptography. And it's really cool because uh, for the same amount of security, um, you can have much smaller key sizes. 
So smaller key sizes directly um, converts into uh, less CPU cycles being used, and it greatly reduces the computational requirements, which made it great for IoT, mobile, and browsers. And if you look at the NIST specs, the National Institute of Science and Tech, I think, oh no, standards uh, for the United States, um, it actually meets the US government's criteria for secret classification. So when we, when we saw this, we, we immediately jumped on it, and we actually built it into our product. So that changed a bit of the flow, right? Um, what happens now is that when you visit a form that's end-to-end um, -end encrypted, um, you'll be the top left there where you are a form submitter, and we actually generate a public-private key pair in the browser, right? So what happens is that we have to do a mathematical operation called an elliptic curve defeat Hellman, right? And what that does is that it takes your private key, the form's public key, and it generates an in-memory symmetric key. So this key in the middle, right, only exists in memory and is always regenerated um, from the data. It's never stored anywhere except in memory and it's transit. So what happens is that we encrypt the form response with the symmetric key. And you can see that um, essentially generation of the symmetric key is slower and compute intensive, but the actual encryption itself is really fast. Right? So um, the first time we did it, um, let's see, the first time we did it, uh, we wanted to make it really efficient in terms of downloading and uh, decrypting. So what we did was we used a streaming uh, implementation where the format database will step through each record and stream it to the server, right? And the server would receive every record and write it to a client stream, right? And the client would essentially do that flow, right? And collate it in a CSV program. Now, once we switched to elliptic curve cryptography, two hours, 40 minutes was reduced to eight minutes. So that's like a 30 times improvement. And there's still a problem though that um, you have to execute this 100,000 times. So if you have 100,000 submissions, you have to do this 100,000 times. And so what that means is that your browser would freeze, the main thread gets choked up, and so the solution was essentially that we would do streaming, but with a web worker. So we would offload the compute intensive part of our work right, into a web worker, and so the main JavaScript thread would essentially post the data um, to a web worker so that it could be run on a separate thread. So you don't freeze up your um, browser rendering, you don't freeze up user interactions, and so on. And when we did this, uh, it was reduced from 8 minutes to 2 minutes 30 seconds. And now, once we use a web worker, we thought, why don't we have more web workers, right? I mean, if you can use one extra thread, why not use like 4 or 8, right? So we switched to having round robin across parallel web workers, right? We do the work in parallel. And this reduced the compute time from 2 minutes 30 seconds to 45 seconds. And this was all great, and we launched NDP last year in June 2019. And we thought, okay, this solution is really uh, is usable. Um, let's try and get it out there for the next big event, which was the Bicentennial Notes. So just a comparison, um, we had more than half a million submissions for National Day ticket applications. Uh, for Bicentennial Notes, um, we had about 200,000. Right? And we thought the event was going well. It's a big event. Uh, we can surely handle the load in the browser. And the reason for that was because the form for the Bicentennial Note application looks really simple with only six questions. Right? So if we could deal with half a million from the previous event, why can't we deal um, with you know, 200,000 for this simple form? And the answer, um, or rather the problem was that um, on the second day of the event launch, our users called us and said, hey, we actually can't decrypt, we can't get our data out of the system, um, what's wrong? And essentially the browser had crashed. So we had to go and find out what happened. Um, and to actually um, explain what was going on, is that in the form, when you're filling it in, they actually had a flow of control to determine what were the drop-down options. So imagine if your bank was DBS, and let's say you lived in the east of Singapore, right? It would only show up the um, options relevant to you. So this is to avoid surfacing like 100 different banks for you to choose from. And the way um, the form was able to do that 
It was actually because it wasn't a six-question form. It had another 51 hidden questions. So essentially, to provide for a good user experience, we had to step through complicated logic to determine which form field would show up uh, when the user selected which uh, drop-down options. And that blew up the response size heavily. Right. So what did we do to try and improve the decryption performance? Right. Um, we went to performance profile with Chrome. And basically, we saw two main uh, problems. The first problem was that um, they also saw two memory spikes. Right. Every time we try and decrypt, um, the, there will be heavy garbage collection causing, um, causing the GC to choke up the thread, but also that your memory growth was not coming down fast enough. So that was a problem with our memory. And secondly was that the web workers appeared to be idling for very long periods of time. So what's going on here? Um, we tried to relieve garbage collection pressure, and when we profiled, um, when we took a look at the memory heap allocation, uh, what we found was that garbage objects were traced to a stream parser called OvoJS. And what OvoJS does was that it would actually uh, parse from a HTTP stream um, the objects that it could find before the download had completed. So normally in, a, in an application, uh, you will probably wait for the download to complete before processing the data. We thought that why don't we do it um, as the data is coming in so that we could make it faster. Right? The downside was that there was, um, in, in the heap space, there was a lot of objects uh, being created as the stream was being parsed. So um, our workaround was essentially to have our server uh, return new line delimited JSON. So on the left here, you can see that um, before, the server would send the standard JSON, um, and the client would parse for nested JSON objects, um, which is kind of a tricky operation. Right? If you send new line delimited JSON, technically it's invalid JSON, but your client now only has to parse for the new line character. And this actually, this simple change actually reduced memory footprints by 10 to 20 times. Right? Sometimes it's really simple, but it can work wonders. And as for the memory spike that we had, um, before we would actually have crashes when we hit the string limit, uh, when we try and concatenate the lines of the CSV. But once you take a look at the block constructor, you realize that hey, actually, um, you can simply create a blob, pass it in an array, and have the blob reference existing data. So you don't have to, um, to trigger file download, you don't have to join all the records of your CSV, right? Um, now, when you come and look at the thread profiling, we saw that, hey, you know, um, are the web workers even paralyzing the work? If you look at the profile here, what you see is that um, the individual web workers, they would be doing work um, but there are these large gaps in between them. So what's going on, right? Um, we realized that there was actually a bug in round robin scheduling, and essentially the bug was that we were not distributing the work when we first received it. Instead, um, we were waiting for a worker to complete it before incrementing a counter. So this is a really simple round robin bug. So once we fix this, voila, right? You see that, hey, I have proof now that in the profiling, the web workers are actually doing work in parallel. So, so that was great. Um, but there's still a problem. Um, the work, if, if, you, if you look at this performance profile, um, there's still a large gap between decryption cycles that the web workers are performing. So what's with all the idling, right? What's the main thread doing? And so when we look at, the, when we look at our main thread execution, uh, we realize that for every 15 milliseconds that we spend decrypting, 260 milliseconds was spent in the byline library. And what the byline library was doing was finding the new line characters. Right? So lots of time was being spent on actually stream transformations as the data was coming in. So how do we optimize that? Um, we actually took the library, um, copied, pasted the code into our own repository, and we made changes so that it would work only for our use case. So we simplified, um, instead of catering for the general case, we catered for our specific case. And what did we do was, um, we realized that encry our encrypted data was always in base 64, so it could, um, it could be represented in ASCII, right? So we, we removed functionality for UTF-8, um, and when we looked at the line splitting code, um, we realized that, hey, it's using regex, which is kind of expensive. Um, it's catering for uh, carriage returns, which we're not sending from our server, right? And Unicode line boundaries. So these are all features that we did not need. Our server only uh, sends new line delimited and no other characters. 
So we pruned all of that out. And what we realized was that it went from 266 milliseconds uh, between decryption cycles down to 35 milliseconds. Right? And so the total time for 10,000 bicentennial submissions went down to about 30 seconds from previously 40 seconds. Right? After we released the improvements to production, um, our users showed up to our office and were like, um, hey, let's see your fix. And essentially what happened um, was that they, we didn't realize it, but they bought a really old tablet, right? And this picture is just for demo purposes, but um, in the Garmin, sometimes um, we have these cycles called tag refresh, where we improve or we swap out old technology for new ones, and not everyone gets the hardware at the same time, right? But with all these improvements, we actually made it work for a 4GB Windows 7 Internet Explorer tablet. And this is really cool. This means that if you can get performance down to like such an efficient level and we can push this out, it means all citizens' data will be protected. Like even though not all of the hardware in the government um, is um, you know, running on like top-notch Apple machines like, like we probably have, right? And it turned out that the user's really happy with decrypted successfully in 15 minutes. Um, and so yeah, so we celebrated this win. Um, so every change, every speed gain, every improvement we made um, was actually resulted in a multiplicative effect. So the very first algorithm, uh, algo change from RSA to analytic curves, um, actually resulted in a speed gain of 20 times. Um, using a web worker, uh, gain us another three times, so on and so forth. And you can see that the multiplicative effects was that for analytic curve alone, um, on that benchmark, there was a 33 times speed up, but compared to RSA, it's about 600 times faster. So this means that this technology is highly performant, um, and we realized that we did not we did not go for like any very difficult uh, optimizations, right? Simply by profiling. So um, some learning points. Um, I would say the number one was that we avoid premature optimization. So um, look at look at this hypothetical graph. Um, every change, you see the biggest change, the easiest change was to just change the encryption library, and that got us a 30x improvement. But every subsequent improvement we, we had to do required more and more expertise, uh, more and more input effort. So I would say the number one rule is avoid premature optimization. Right? Every time you copy code uh, from a library into your own use case, you're actually taking on the maintenance burden, right? and it will be easier to introduce bugs. So that's one point. Um, the second point would be, I think, to avoid speculation and performance profile instead, because that's the only evidence that you have, right? Everything else is conjecture. So some, uh, we had a lot of team discussions about um, what would it take to get this to work under time pressure in a production environment. Um, so th these are a bunch of uh, famous lines that we said in the office, like, oh, we need WebAssembly for this. Actually, we didn't. Like the benchmark showed that um, it was already comparable. Um, we needed to replace our stringer pens with array joints, or we needed to pre-allocate our arrays right by filling it with empty strings. So that's not actually how JavaScript works under the hood. Um, or we had to say move embarrassingly parallel tasks into our web workers. That we actually did that, but it only resulted in marginal performance gains, which was which didn't make the table you saw earlier. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening to me. Um, that was uh, essentially um, what we did to roll out this feature. It's currently in closed beta. We're hoping to roll it out by the end of this quarter. And I hope all of you will get to use it, whether you know it or not. So thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. If you want the slides, they're available um, at this uh, URL. So yeah, thanks very much. Yeah.